The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Grains, CNM Seeds, and Syngenta Canada. Find more episodes of The Wheat School by going to wheatschool.com. Sean Haney here with Real Agriculture, and today on The Wheat School, we're talking to Shad Milligan. He's with Syngenta. He is their seed care technical lead for Western Canada. We're going to talk about a real menace on the Western Canadian prairies, and that is the wireworm. If you have wireworms, you know it. It can be a devastating impact when it comes to your crop production. But are they a little bit more prolific on the prairies than some farmers actually understand there to be? We're going to talk about that and what are some of the ways and things that we can do to manage the wireworm. Let's dig into it. Chad, today on The Wheat School, we're going to talk about wireworms. And I guess before we get into the management of them, look when you look at the population and what you've learned about wireworms over your career, how prolific are they on the prairies? So it's a great question, Sean, because if you start to look in the past, I've been part of a few sur- uh, surveys done with uh, Syngenta as well as with Agriculture Canada. And from that work, uh, we've really seen, uh, you know, number one, what we've seen, not so much from a population standpoint, uh, I'll talk to that maybe in a second, but really is, is species. And where people thought wireworms weren't, they were actually there. And so that's been an interesting uh, idea that, you know, there's always been this uh, idea that in the light, light brown soil zone, uh, lighter soils, southern Alberta, uh, southwest Saskatchewan, you know, those were the pockets or areas where wireworms were and growers knew about them and they had to manage it, manage those. The interesting part of the survey work is really seeing uh, spots where people were, you know, we didn't think that you'd be seeing wireworms. So it's it's something that that's an interesting aspect of that the wireworm wireworm is actually across Western Canada. Uh, and to speak to the population uh, side of things, I think we've really seen where the levels uh, farmers have been managing wireworms for quite some time. Yeah, uh, we did have products years ago which were very very good at taking the whole population out and when I talk about the whole population it could be some of the resident wireworms some of the new neonate uh, wireworms that were there as well as the the, the actual uh, bigger uh, larva form of the wireworm uh, thus allowing the grower to get a crop and allowing actually you being a farmer to not have to worry about treating seed for every couple of years on that particular piece because you were taking out a large percent of the population However, those products weren't really good for the environment. So that was the trade-off of things as we've learned. So um, those products were taken off market and we were limited to, uh, you know, at the end of the day, a new management tool to help growers get stand establishment, but there wasn't that product in place to really bring down those populations. And what we saw from there, from a population standpoint, you saw a slow increase to epidemic levels. And that's just what it was. We didn't really pay attention to it too much until it was too late. So you may have saw some holes in your field or some plants missing down the row and attributed to other things, but truly it was a wireworm problem and not really getting on top of it. We've really seen some areas really go from not having problems to it being a major problem. And because of all the damage that they can do, it can be very significant from a crop loss standpoint. What's the recommendation now on how to manage them? Yeah, it's great. You know, it's actually, it's great because there's some management tools out there. We've, we've been, we've been fortunate enough here in, in the marketplace to uh, have products in place to really stop, uh, stop that feeding, uh, get your stand established and allow that plant to move forward while that wire room uh, really, uh, you know, partially what, what, what the management side of things is, the, the wire room life cycle is, is a long one. It's not a short one like most insects. It can be in your soil f- for three to five years until it, uh, it grows into an adult click beetle. Uh, as well, uh, their feeding habits tend to be when the soil is moist and cooler, and they're really attracted to the plant when it germinates. And that, when that plant germinates, CO, CO2 is coming out, so that's the initial attraction. So that, that cool, wet soils are there. They don't like warm, dry soils. So as we move through that season into, you know, as spring progresses, that, that soil zone warms up, dries out, kind of driving the wireworms down as well. So 
one aspect that the management tools in place that we have is again those C treatments that can and will protect that plant systemically but there are some new management options out there too that allow growers to start to take the po uh, the populations down as a mortality product when we look at like things like uh, cabbage seed pod weevil or grasshoppers we have a forecast right do, do we have anything like that when it comes to wireworms so it's so a great question sean and i i wish i had i wish we had these tools and i i think we're, we're looking at different tools from a digital standpoint from previous years but as of right now there's really no boom, here's your forecast, you have this many wireworms in your field, or this is the percent damage that they're going to do this year. Uh, no, uh, unfortunately, it's, you're, uh, you're, you're checking your seed depth and you're finding wireworms. Uh, then most generally you have wireworms. What we have been able to do to somewhat allow us to, for, I, for what I would call a forecast, is that we have click beetle traps. So we've been able to... Uh, set these into the field in the corner it's basically a plastic uh, it's a plastic trap that uh, catches the adult click beetle we can then look at uh, what species that is and determine you know again uh, the correlation back to seeing the adult is most likely you're going to have that adult laying eggs into your field in that july time period so with the eggs hatching into that larvae side of things you, that cycle will repeat itself then again, you get into that, that, that life cycle is where, again, they're in that field three to five years before they, get, they grow into the adult click beetle. So it's not really so much a forecast, it's just it's a determining factor. That yes, they're, they're present. And as well, it gives us an idea of species because what we've seen from the survey work as well, we really have three main species with a fourth in there as well across the Western Canadian prairies on that. And do we have a do we have well established economic thresholds when it comes to wireworms, or is it a case of they're there, you need to deal with it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the I would, the economic thresholds, if if they're there, it's too late. Uh, if you're seeing that percent damage, uh, if you're seeing your crop thinned out or plant stand reduced by you know that twenty percent one year, uh, I think that it's. It's that situation, it's too late. You have to think about what you're gonna be doing in that field for next year, uh, whether you're going back to a cereal, because the wireworm really are attracted to the cereal crops. That's, that's predominantly what they would feed on. Uh, corn, barley, wheat are those, those three main ones that they'll feed on. But as well, uh, I've seen uh, lentils are another one that are affected. They will be uh, ate by wireworms. Uh, peas and chickpeas tend to be um, not really touched by the worms but in all my experience I've only seen a, as well as canola in my experience I've only seen one field in southern Alberta ever affected by wireworm damage so really when you start to look at that that is really what your cereal crop is and what that piece of land has done in the past so again if I think farmers know their land uh, very well and what constitutes you know pressures or problems in that particular area so that management side of things, you just got to be conscientious of what you're going to be putting in there from a rotational standpoint, as well as uh, it's as easy to document it. You know, throw that in uh, to your phone, put it in a yield map, whatever that may look like. If you can do those type of notes to get you thinking for that following year. Uh, but the best and easiest way for that wireworm management really is, the, is that is that seed treatment side of things. And you do have some options out there when it comes to the seed treatment for protection against wireworms.